Hello and welcome to today's lesson which is a lesson bridging the link between GCSE and A-level physics. Now in today's lesson we're going to look at one of the topics that was covered in Year 11 GCSE Physics in Paper 2 of GCSE Physics Ways which also comes up on Paper 1 of A-level Physics. So we're going to look at some of the some of the properties of waves in an A-level physics concept. So, what do we know? Well, we know that a wave is a mechanism that transfers energy or information from one place in the universe to another place in the universe without transferring matter. So energy starts at one position, it travels along the wave, and it finishes at that point. Now, the particles will oscillate during this process, but will not travel from point A to point B. So in this particular example, the energy is traveling from the right-hand side of the screen to the left-hand side of the screen. Now the particles will oscillate to allow this to happen, but the particles themselves will not move from the right-hand side of the screen to the left-hand side of the screen. So the particles will vibrate or oscillate backwards and forwards, but there's no net movement of particles. So they'll go backwards and forwards or left to right in this example, but there will be no net movement. So a wave is a way to transfer energy from one place to another place without transferring matter. So it causes the particles to vibrate backwards and forwards like this or up and down like this. Now that is called an oscillation or a vibration. So we can say a wave as well as causing energy to be transferred from one place in the universe to another place can cause particles to oscillate or vibrate. Now one complete wave or oscillation is when particles move from one way then the other and go back to where they start. So this would be one complete oscillation or wave. Now you'll notice in that particular example the, the particle finished where it started. So it went one way back to equilibrium, the centre, to the other way, and back to where it started, which was the equilibrium of the centre. Now, the correct name for energy transfer, now we're at A-level, is propagation. So another phrase we would use in terms of how energy is transferred, we would call it propagation. So a wave is a pathway for energy to move position in the universe and can cause the energy to change store. So the wave is an oscillation or vibration of particles, and the oscillation is a representation of the energy found in the wave. So the greater the energy in the wave, the larger the oscillation. Now, two different materials can be oscillated by a wave, so there can be electromagnetic waves and mechanical waves. So a mechanical wave is a wave which is oscillation of matter, For example, atoms. So there's no displacement of particles, the particles move backwards and forwards, which you can see in this particular animation. The uh, red dot is just highlighting two particles of this particular wave, and you'll notice that if you just focus on these red dots, that the particles are oscillating backwards and forwards as the wave transfers through. So whilst it might look at first glance that the particles are travelling from one side to the other, that is in fact not the case. The particles are in fact oscillating backwards and forwards. So in a mechanical wave, yeah, you need particles for energy to be transferred, so they can't work in a vacuum because you do need those particles for a mechanical wave, but there's no net displacement of the particles. So there's no overall movement of the particles. So for example, sound. Sound is a mechanical wave. Now in this particular example, you you will need air particles for sound waves to travel, however those, those particles do not travel from the human mouth, which could be making the sound, to the human ear, which detects the sound, rather the particles oscillate backwards and forwards and it's the energy that transfers. So the sound wave is actually a series of particle vibrations backwards and forwards collide with the next particle and making that particle vibrate by passing the energy on. Now, there's another way in which we can classify particles and waves, sorry, and that is via calling the transverse waves or longitudinal waves. So a transverse wave is a wave which transfers energy by the particles or the material oscillating perpendicular or right angles to propagation, the direction of energy transfer. 
So this is shown in this particular example. The particles will oscillate or vibrate, but they'll oscillate or vibrate perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. So like we said before, in a way, the particles do not move position. They only move backwards and forwards. So an example of a transverse wave can be a water wave ripple. Now, a longitudinal wave is when a wave transfers energy by the particles of material oscillating parallel to the direction of energy transfer or parallel to propagation. So an example of this one would be a sound wave, for example. So transverse waves are waves which transfer energy by oscillating perpendicular or at right angles to the direction in which the energy transfers. So if you assume the energy propagates from left to right, the wave would oscillate up and down. Now all electromagnetic waves are transverse, so some examples of transverse waves might be radio waves, light waves, UV rays, X-rays, Water waves, which aren't electromagnetic waves, by the way, but that can also be another transverse wave. Waves on a string, ripples, okay, lots of examples of transverse waves. Now, longitudinal waves are waves that transfer energy by oscillating parallel to the direction in which the energy transfers or via propagation. So, if you assume the energy propagates from left to right, the waves oscillate from left to right. So examples of this can be sound waves, p seismic waves, and some examples of water waves. Now we can look at the properties of a wave by looking at the terms of the different characteristics of a wave. So this is an example of a transverse wave diagram. Now once again, this shows that the particles don't change position, they only move backwards and forwards, they vibrate. So in one particular cycle, the particle will move one way, then the other way, back to equilibrium, okay, eventually. Now, the amplitude, which is measured in meters, is the maximum displacement from the particle's equilibrium position. Now, we can define um, equilibrium as the dead center of the cycle, which is the center, the x-axis, of this particular graph. Now, displacement is a vector, so we're going to have both a positive and a negative quantity. So a negative displacement, the bottom half of the graph, the part of the graph below the x-axis, just indicates the other direction, because a negative in terms of vectors indicates as going the opposite direction. So if we said that the positive displacement was up, the negative displacement would be down. If we define the positive displacement to be right, the negative displacement would be to the left. So that's just an indication of what's going on. Now the wavelength is a measure okay, of the length of one whole cycle. So it could be from the peak of a wave to the next peak of the next wave. It could be from the trough of one wave to the trough of the next wave. It could be from the center point of one wave to that same center point of the next wave. Now it's measured in meters as well. Now it's the distance the wave will travel before it repeats itself. Now the time period, which is measured in seconds, is the time taken for one complete wave to happen. So like wavelength, it can be measured as the time it takes between two peaks, or the time between two troughs, or the time between two same points on consecutive waves. So it's the distance the wave will travel before the wave repeats itself. Now frequency, which is measured in hertz, is the number of complete oscillations in a wave in one second. And we know that frequency is one over time period. So let's just clarify that. Amplitude is the is the maximum displacement, the furthest a particle can travel from equilibrium position when in a wave. The wavelength of a wave is the length of one whole cycle, so it could be between two adjacent peaks, two adjacent troughs, or from one point of the wave to the same point on the next wave. The time period is the time it takes for one complete wave. It's the time it takes for one wavelength to occur. So as a result, it's the time it takes between two adjacent peaks, two adjacent troughs, or between two same points on consecutive waves. And then we can link it into this idea of frequency, because we know frequency is how many waves are passed uh, through a point each second or produced every second. So we know that it's measured in hertz. So 20 hertz is 20 waves passing a point every second. One hertz is one wave being produced every second. And we can calculate frequency by saying frequency is one over the time period in seconds. Now, we can then work out how fast a wave travels in a medium by carrying out the following calculation. Wave speed in meters per second is equal to the frequency of a wave in hertz times by the wavelength of a wave in meters. It's the equation that shows you how fast a wave will transfer energy through the universe. And it can only work out the speed of a wave. So nothing else can use this equation to work out the speed of it 
only waves. Now, for this equation to work correctly, the frequency has to be in hertz and the wavelength has to be in meters. So you'd have to convert values if they weren't given enough. Now, you might know this already, but the speed of all electromagnetic waves in the universe in a vacuum or in air is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. That's the fastest possible speed in the universe. No wave, no matter can travel faster than an electromagnetic field in air or in a vacuum. Now, all, now, electromagnetic waves will alter their frequency and their wavelengths to always give a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. So if, for example, you have a radio wave and you have a gamma wave, well, a radio wave has a long wavelength yet short frequency, so the two numbers will times to get 3 times 10 to the 8, whilst a gamma wave will have a high frequency but a very short wavelength, so the numbers times together to give 3 times 10 to the 8 meters. So the higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency, and the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Now, mechanical waves don't travel at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. They travel a lot slower than that. And mechanical waves travel at different speeds for the different materials that they're in. So, for example, a mechanical wave like a sound wave will travel faster in iron than it will do in air because it's a different medium. Now, the mechanical wave speed depends on the mass of the particles moving and the density of the material. Now, like we mentioned before, hertz is the number of complete waves per second. It's the unit of frequency. So let's just make sure we understand this. Electromagnetic waves all travel at the same speed. That's the fastest possible speed in the universe because all electromagnetic waves are massless. They don't have a mass attached to them. And the speed of all electromagnetic waves in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Mechanical waves travel at different speeds since it depends on particle mass and density. And because they, the mechanical waves are moving particles, uh, they will all travel slower than electromagnetic waves. Now, there's another property in addition to the ones you looked at previously, which is just a property we look at A level, and that is phase difference. So to understand phase difference, we've got to consider a waveform. So we consider a wave to be made out of particles, oscillating as such like that. Now remember, in the progressive wave, only the energy is transferred along the wave. So these particles will vibrate in this particular example up and down, but the energy will transfer from left to right. Now, two particles are in phase if they are oscillating at the same time as each other. So you'll notice on this diagram, the two green particles are oscillating at the same time as each other, because we know this because we're at the same point, in space, they're both at the same height, so we know that they're oscillating in the same direction at the same time. Now, if two particles are doing this, they are in phase. There is no phase difference, because phase just means point of oscillation. Now, because they're at the same point of oscillation, they have no difference in phase. They are in phase. There is a zero phase difference. Now, this could be any two particles in a wave. It doesn't have to be the two I've just highlighted. So look at these two red particles. These two red particles are both oscillating at the same time or at the same speed because they're at the same point in the particular wave. So we know that they have no phase difference. They are for the same oscillation, so they must have zero phase difference. Now, we know that particles that are in phase are an integer, a whole number, n, n number of wavelengths apart. So two particles in your wave were one wavelength apart, they would be in phase. If they were two wavelengths apart, they would be in phase. If they were three wavelengths apart, they would be in phase. So on, so on, so on. Now, we also know, if you haven't covered this yet, we'll look at this later in the course, that one wavelength is 360 degrees, or 2 pi radians, which is just another measurement of an angle. So you can measure angles in radians or degrees. Now, 360 degrees equals 2 pi radians. So therefore, if you're in phase, it's n times by 360 degrees or n times by 2 pi radians. Now, this actually makes sense because the pattern has gone back to what it was originally. It started repeating itself. So the particles will have the same phase because it's the same pattern repeating itself over and over and over and over again. It's literally gone full circle. Now, when particles are oscillating in the opposite direction to each other, 
they have a full phase difference, they are out of phase. So if you look at one green and one red particle in this example, well, they're oscillating in opposite directions. We know this because one is going upwards and one is going downwards. We can see that from our diagram. So because they're oscillating in completely opposite directions, we know that they must be out of phase. Now, we know particles are out of phase if they are half a wavelength apart from each other. So, if you're in phase, you're a full wavelength apart from each other. If you're completely out of phase, you're half a wavelength apart from each other. So, we can say that if you're out of phase, you are pi radians apart, or you're 180 degrees apart, or you're a multiple of this. Now, just to clarify, out of phase occurs when any two particles are half a wavelength from each other. Now, even at equilibrium points, because the particles are moving up in opposite directions, they're out of phase because one of the purple particles is moving upwards and one of the purple particles is moving downwards, so they cancel each other out and therefore they're out of phase. Now, just to clarify, you can work out the phase difference of any two particles in a wave. However, if it's a whole wavelength apart, we say that they're in phase. If they're half a wavelength apart, they are out of phase. If it's just in between those two values, it's just a phase difference. So you can just work out the value of the phase difference. So you might say the three quarters of a, a path difference between them, or you would say, therefore, three quarters of an entire wavelength is going to be 270 degrees or one and a half radians apart from each other. Now let's consider two progressive waves traveling like this. So our red wave is going to the right hand side, our left, our blue wave is going to the left hand side. So what would happen if these two waves met and what happened after they met? Well when these two progressive waves meet they will cancel and no wave will be present. But that effect only happens for an instance and afterwards the waves will move past each other in opposite directions. Now this principle is called superposition or interference. It's when two progressive waves, two waves which are travelling, like in the example before, okay, when they combine with each other to form one single super or resultant wave when they overlap. So a bit like how previously at GCSE, when we had two forces, we could add them. Well, when we've got two progressive waves, we can also add them as well. Now, in the previous example, they added to zero because one wave was going in a positive direction, so we gave it a plus. The other wave was traveling in the opposite direction, so it was a negative. So when we had a positive and a negative, if they're of the same value, they will equal zero. Now, it's important to note you can only superimpose or interfere or add the waves if they are coherent with each other. Now, coherent means that the two waves have a constant phase difference with each other, so have the same phase difference throughout the entire of the waves. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a particular value of phase difference, just that it doesn't change, so it could be pi, it could be pi radians, it could be 2 pi radians, it could be 3 pi radians, it could be 45 degrees, it could be 47.34 degrees, as long as it stays constant. And also that the two waves have the same frequency. So you only get superposition when either two waves have a constant phase difference and the same frequency. Now, when a crest and a trough encounter each other, they don't produce a wave. Because like we mentioned before, the positive and the negative of the, um, of the displacements, obviously the red one being a positive and the blue one being a negative, if they're of equal value, will cancel out and you get no wave. And we call that destructive interference. So destructive interference can be observed in the universe as a lack of wave. So, for example, it would be like if two light waves were shining near each other and they produced no light, or two sound waves were, were uh, projected next to it and produced no sound. That's an example of destructive interference. Now, destructive interference occurs when the path difference between the two waves is a multiple of half a wavelength. Because remember, if you're out of phase, you can produce destructive interference. So we would say that the phase difference is a multiple of 180 degrees or odd multiple pi radians. Now, an example of destructive interference 
would be noise cancelling headphones. So when you get an external sound wave, the sound wave from the headphones is of equal but opposite value, so they will cancel each other through and you get no sound wave, no noise, you get destructive interference. But what would happen in this situation? We've still got two progressive waves now, but if you look at their phase difference, their phase difference is zero. It's not at all a whole wavelength. It's not half a wavelength like in the previous example. Well, when these two progressive waves add and superimpose, they produce a larger wave. They produce a bigger wave. A wave with a larger amplitude, a larger peak, a larger trough. Now, this effect only happens for an instance, and afterwards the waves move past each other in opposite directions. Now, when a crest and a crest encounter each other, they produce a large crest or a super crest, and obviously a trough and a trough produce a super trough. That is what we call constructive interference. Now, that's observed as the high presence of a wave. So, for example, bright light is produced when two light waves overlap each other, or a loud sound is produced when two sound waves overlap each other. Now, basically, what happens in this situation is constructive interference occurs when the path difference between the two waves is a multiple of a wavelength. So now, it's like, for example, two negatives added together. So, for example, we said minus 2 and minus 2 were added together. We get minus 4. You'd get a bigger trough. What if you had plus 2 and plus 2? Well, you get plus 4, a bigger peak. So as a result, constructive interference occurs when the path difference between the two waves is of a multiple of a wavelength. So one wavelength, two wavelength, three wavelength, four wavelength. Or you could call in terms of phase difference, it's a multiple of 360 degrees, because that's what one wavelength is, or multiple pi radians. So two pi radians, four pi radians, six pi radians, eight pi radians. Because 360 degrees is two pi radians. Now, the phase difference does not lead to constructive or destructive interference. Like before, superposition would still occur. You still get one wave, but it wouldn't be a maximum or it wouldn't be nothing. It would be in between. Now, only a maximum minimum is not produced if you don't have exact constructive and destructive interference. Now, what would happen if a progressive wave travelled and hit a wall? Well, as it hits off the wall, you know that the wave, some of it will transmit through, some of it will get absorbed by the wall, but some of it will reflect. Now, what we've got is we've got a reflected wave. Now, these two waves, the original wave and the reflected wave, would interfere with the, each other. Why would they interfere with each other? Well, they're coherent because as it's the same wave, they will have a constant phase difference and they'll have the same frequency. Now, it'll produce one resultant wave by a superposition. Now we call this type of wave a standing wave or a stationary wave. Now in this wave the particles still oscillate except, except the zero displacement but the energy is displayed rather than progressive which is where the name stationary or standing wave comes from. The energy is stationary now. It's being displayed. It's not transferring like a progressive wave would allow it to. So a standing wave is produced by two progressive waves interfering. The progressive waves do not disappear, but they combine to produce one standing wave by a superposition. Now an area of a standing wave with no displacement, because you've got destructive interference, so the reflected wave and the original wave at that point in the wave will cancel each other out, is called a node. So we have nodes in our standing wave pattern. Now, we call them nodes because they have no energy there. They have no displacement there. They have no oscillation there. Now, the areas of the standing wave which form maximum displacement, either the super peak or the super trough, is called an antinode. So antinodes can either be the peak or the trough, and that's formed by constant interference. So between two consecutive nodes, we'll notice by looking at our diagram that the difference between two nodes is half a wavelength, which therefore gives us a phase difference, like we said before, of pi radians, which must stay constant for interference to occur. But what about two antinodes? Well, again, the difference between two antinodes is half a wavelength. And it gives a phase difference of pi radians, which also must stay constant for interference to occur. Now, as standing waves are produced by two progressive waves, it's more appropriate to show both waves and the standing waves when looking at the waveform. Now, that's the same example as the previous one, except it's not a reflection of the wall, it's just two progressive waves coming at each other as such. 
So stationary waves are literally not stationary, but in contrast to progressive waves, the energy is stationary, it is stored, and it's not transmitted. It doesn't move from one place to another because the two progressive waves cancel each other out. Now, the particles at the node have no energy and do not vibrate, whilst the particles at the antinode have maximum energy and have maximum amplitude vibration. And this can be dangerous as you can get different areas of particle vibration which can break materials. I mean, the most famous example would be in a microwave oven. Well, a microwave oven works as a microwave is emitted, it reflects off the side of the microwave oven, it then interferes with the original wave that's produced, so you get a standard microwave. So you get areas of anti-nodes where you'll get lots of heating and areas of nodes which have no heating. So as a result, if you did not rotate your food in a microwave oven, you'd get areas of very, very hot food in areas of very cold food, which is why you rotate your food, which is an, which is an interesting experiment to want, if you want to carry out. If you take out the turntable of your microwave oven, you'll observe food with hot spots and cold spots. Now, in A-level physics, you've also got to consider what we call the harmonics or the harmonic patterns of standing waves that can be produced. But they can be produced with nodes at either ends. So you've got one node at one end and one node at another end. Now, the first harmonic is the lowest possible frequency that can give us a standing wave. It's the simplest type of standing wave. So if we consider L to be the distance of the string, in this particular example, uh, the length of the string is given us half a wavelength. Because as you know, a wavelength is from is one um, positive amplitude, then one negative amplitude, then back to the uh, center again. You've only got one of those aspects, so therefore the length is half a wavelength. So the wavelength is actually 2L. And if we know that speed equals frequency times by wavelength, well, therefore, the frequency of the first harmonic is the speed of the wave divided by the wavelength, which we know in this example is 2L. Now, let's look at the second harmonic. Now, you'll notice we call harmonics after the number of antinodes that can be produced. So, for example, the first harmonic has one antinode. The second harmonic has two antinodes. Now, if we look at this example now, well, the length of the string is one whole wavelength because if you notice on our length it goes one way then the other then back to the center so we now know that the length equals the wavelength so therefore if we know that f equals c over lambda so f equals c over l so now the frequency of the second harmonic is equal to two times the frequency of the first and if you look at the third harmonic we can work that one through again but if you work it through you'll notice that the frequency of the third harmonic is three Three times by the first harmonic. So to work out the frequency of where any harmonic can be produced for a standing wave, it's the harmonic number, for example the third harmonic, the fourth harmonic, the fifth harmonic, the 97th harmonic, times by the frequency of the first harmonic. So if you want to work out the frequency of any harmonic wave, you've got to work out the frequency of the first wave, which is when you've only got one antinode, and then you multiply your harmonic number by that value. So here are the trends you've got to know. That in any harmonic pattern, there's the same number of antinodes as there are harmonic number. There is a harmonic number plus one number of nodes. So in our previous example, it's the third harmonic, we've got three antinodes and four nodes. In the second harmonic, we've got two antinodes and three nodes. We can work it through like that. The frequency of the harmonic vibration is the fundamental frequency, the frequency of the first harmonic times by the harmonic number, and the wavelength of the harmonic vibration is 2 over the harmonic number times by the length of the string. So let's have a look and see if we can follow this pattern. So for the second harmonic, there is going to be three nodes because you always have one more than the harmonic number. How many antinodes? Well, it's the same as the harmonic number. Two. What's the harmonic frequency? It's the harmonic number times by the, the first frequency. And then what's the harmonic wavelength? It's going to be um, two ta times by the length over the harmonic number. So two times by L over two equals L. Number of nodes, the, th the third harmonic is four, the antinodes is three, the harmonic frequency is three F1, 
a and then it's going to be two thirds over l because it's going to be two times by l over the harmonic number so two thirds l how about the number of nodes for the fourth harmonic well it'll be five the number of antinodes is going to be the same as harmonic number four the harmonic frequency is the harmonic number times by the, the first frequency and then the final last one is going to be two l over the harmonic number two over four l a half l so let's just look at this final example. So with the ha first harmonic, we know you've only got one antinode and two nodes, so it forms that pattern, because you've, you've got two nodes at either side and one antinode in the middle. Harmonic frequency is always F1, and the wavelength is 2L, because remember, it is a 2L over the harmonic number. What about the second one? Well, now you've got three nodes and you've got two antinodes. Your harmonic frequency is 2 times by F1. Your harmonic wavelength is L plus it's 2L over harmonic number. So 2L over 2 equals L. In this one, in our third harmonic, we've got 3 antinodes and 4 nodes. We've then got 3F1 as our harmonic frequency. Then our harmonic wavelength is 2 thirds L plus it's 2L over the harmonic number. And finally, the fourth harmonic, well, you've got 4 antinodes got five nodes you've got a harmonic frequency of 4f1 and then finally to work out the harmonic wavelength it is 2l over the harmonic number so 2l over 4 which simplifies to half l so in this particular session we've looked at what a wave is we've looked at the properties of a wave such as amplitude frequency wavelength and we've looked at the concept of transverse and longitudinal waves. We've looked at this idea of phase difference and how it links into superposition or interference. And then finally, we've looked at harmonic wave patterns. Now that sets us up nicely for the start of the waves topic in A-level physics. If you want to read on further, you can look at how you can form interference patterns with constructive and destructive interference with diffraction gradients or two, diff or two slits, in fact, called Young slits, or you can then look at the process of refraction and total internal reflection and the process of how fiber optics works. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson, which is led as an introductory lesson on the waves topic of AL physics, and have a lovely day.